<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Here we are. This is um, April 16th, and I'm here with a bunch of you who are very curious about the Meridine. I'm going to refer to the Meridine instead of Meridon LIV or platform, just as Meridine. So when I say that, that's what you know what I'm talking about. So some of you are new to me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I'm a holistic bone coach, and I have kept my bones strong since I was diagnosed with osteopenia in my 50s, and I was given a script for Fosamex, um, which I declined. Now, some people need medication, so this is not about that. I'm just telling you about my journey. My spine is normal. It went from osteopenia back to normal. My hips were osteopenia, and my wrist is where my osteoporosis is. So I have I take women through a seven-week comprehensive program called Stronger Bones, Healthy You. And we talk about from DEXA to blood work, to bone markers, to food, to excess of the whole, the whole gamut. And some of my graduates are, are on the call tonight. So Meridine has been in my radar for quite some time, um, actually for several years. And it was one of the Bones Tribe members who purchased the Meridine and found that her TBS had improved. And I thought, that's interesting. So that was the first time that I heard of something like like that. And then I've been listening to Clinton Rubin speaking um, many times and I've been searching the internet, but I thought maybe there's more that obviously needs to be shared. So I thought that <laughs> we should talk about this because this is a natural, a possible natural addition, addition. So we know that when we have the diagnosis of osteoporosis, it's a multidisciplinary holistic approach. We have to work with a knowledgeable doctor who specializes in osteoporosis. That's very important because sometimes they say that they do and they it's just a sidebar gig, but we want to deal with somebody who really specializes in osteoporosis. Getting proper tests, that's the DEXA, the TBS, the blood work, the bone markers, eating food for healthy bones and improving your digestive health, supplementing with the appropriate supplementation, uh, reducing inflammation, stress, getting quality sleep, and exercise, weight-bearing exercise, and balance exercise. And I had spoken with Dr. McCormick. Some of you know Dr. McCormick's work. And what he said was the Meridine is a supportive tool for osteoporosis in conjunction with weight bearing exercise. Meridine is not a substitute for exercise. And he apologizes that it didn't get into his Bible that just came out, Great Bones, taking control of your osteoporosis because he is now on board with Meridine. So that was a, a good piece of information that I thought, okay, let's go forward and let, have, let, let me seek out Ian. So let me tell you a little bit about Ian. Um, he's a UK national living in the US. Um, his profession is he's commercial commercialization of medical devices and a co-owner of Copa Health, who uh, distributes, is a main distributor, one of the distributors, and imports Meridine. And what I loved about what Ian shared is that for 25 years, he's worked with Clinton Rubin um, in low-intensity vibration technologies. So I think that that uh, gives some credibility to his knowledge. Um, so what I'd like to do, Ian, could you start, dive right into the studies and <clears throat> can we talk about the mesenchymal cell and what the uh, the Meridine is known to do and break it down and, and put it into layman's terms. And I know you're good at that. So if we do that as a very brief intro, then what we can do, uh, if that works, is go through the questions and I can answer those as you had uh, sort of collated them. Okay. Uh, over the last period. So essentially what low intensity vibration is, is as Irma said, it's an exercise. It's, a, it's different to weight bearing exercise that we would all know, like walking, running, jumping, which you would term as high magnitude, low frequency, because heel strikes, if you're walking are about once a second. If you're running, it may be two or three times a second, depending on how fast you are. But the force levels that go through your leg at that time are big. Whereas with a Maradine, you're creating 30 movements a second, but at a very small level of force. And we use the measure of acceleration because we're moving the person against gravity to create an upward mechanical force that goes up through the body, through the legs and the axial skeleton. Um, but it creates a different response inside 
a couple of important pathways, which are in the long bone marrow. It suppresses the formation of fat, which is occurring increasingly as we get older in the bone marrow. And it's enhancing the formation of cells that are useful, like osteoblasts, which the bone building cells, chondrocytes, cartilage, fibroblast skin, muscle cells. But with regard to bone, it's been studied pretty intensely over the last 10 to 15 years by people like Clint Rubin and other researchers, that you show that these small, fast movements create a different response in the formation pathway than maybe occurring with walking or jumping or running or some bigger magnitude exercise. So essentially what you're doing is increasing the production of osteoblasts, slowing down the intrusion of fat into that new cell process. And the LIV also has a small role in impeding bone resorption, which is the osteoclast, like the Pac-Man that's coming around eating up the bone that we don't need. But increasingly as we age, we're not producing enough. So that's been deemed a bad artist within this theater that we're in, but actually it's a very useful cell and shouldn't be completely impeded or eliminated. So the, the LIV has an effect on the resorption, but primarily what it's doing is creating more bone formation in the osteoblasts. And because it's mechanical, body load goes down, acceleration goes up. The, the structures you want to maintain, like the trabecular bone and the cortical bone, are being addressed by the LIV. So it does actually increase the size and the quality in the trabecular structure. And that's measurable with things like MRI scans. They can pick up substantive changes in around six months. And it also has some effects on cortical thickness closer to the source of the acceleration. So in the lower leg, some recent data has shown sort of thickening of the cortex. But in addition, there is a quality maintenance in the trabecular structure, which is important to keep that sort of elasticity in the long bones. Okay, so let's let's stop for a second because I just want to make sure that we're good with this. So as we get older, as I understand it, as we get older, we don't make as much osteoblast. The mesenchymal, the whole cell relationship, it can either turn into fat or it can turn into an osteoblast. Is that, do I have that right? You have that right. And increasingly yes. fat is being formed. So we want to stop that process. This is, this is sort of at the bare bones of it all. Right. So we want to stop that. <laughs> we want to stop that process. But as we get older, things change, like we get wrinkles and various other things happen. So we want to just quiet that down. Fat skinny has been talked about within our community, very slender women and and blood work has indicating that indicated that that may be the case. So this is just an important piece as far as the whole um, feeding the, pro the cell properly. <clears throat> is that, do I have that correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And what the LRV seems to do is increase the amount of mesenchymal stem cells. So it actually mm -hmm. increases them more than they would normally be increasing. So it's a, essentially it's a very, it's a targeted exercise. It replaces nothing. It's just additional. Mm -hmm. And it has some characteristics that you can't achieve with the usual exercise that people are doing. Because of the level of the vibration. Because of the size of the force and the speed, the, the number of movements per second. So we'll get into that for a second. But the one thing I did want to share when I went to visit Nancy in New York City, who has the trabecular, excuse me, has the uh, Meridine, and I had my own personal experience on it, what I realized, and this, we're going to ask this question, a couple of these questions came up. What I realized is that when I stood on it and, you know, the positioning, I thought, had an impact, like if I was leaning forward, it was like, uh oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be straight and we're gonna talk about this. But what I noticed in, this is just my personal experience, is that I felt a level of calm inside of me that I didn't even know I needed. So I got off of that machine and I thought, whoa, I didn't know I was carrying sort of a low dose of anxiety, which many of us do. And that was temporarily gone. And that was like, oh, that's, that's an additional gift. So. Anyway, I didn't want to interrupt it. That was my personal experience being on that. But you're saying that the trabecular bone score, that's the inner bone. 
versus the outer bone, the cortical, right? That's what we're, that's what the maradine is known to improve. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it's addressing the trabecular bone throughout, but it's also mm -hmm. affecting cortical bone nearer the source of the input. So the challenge you have in the normal market is there aren't MRI scans that people have access to to look at bone changes, you know, for various reasons, the, the equipment, the radiographic, you know, the radiology load, etc. But DEXA is the standard out there. So we have to work with that tool, you know, to know where we are and then at some future point afterwards, what's changed. And um, TBS is a very helpful additional measure over and above the older Z score and T score benchmarks that you've been using all these years. So, so TBS, for those that don't know, is the trabecular bone score. It's an adjunct to the DEXA test. It's a $10,000 software that more and more um, radiology or DEXA facilities are adding because it gives another data point and it gives a full picture of what's going on the bones. So what else? What else would you like to say? Do you want to talk about... So we'll go through the questions and then we can, um, I okay. think we'll have a journey through those if that works. We'll do that. So these are the pre-submitted questions that we're going to go through. Um, I heard the, the Maradon helps with balance, but not specifically bone building. Yeah, so there's a publication that was by Dr. Leung from Hong Kong around... 11 years ago, and he studied older, older women in um, the Hong Kong Chinese population. So they were basically women in their 60s, so postmenopausal, and they looked at bone effect, but also muscle and balance and fall rates. And they had one group with low intensity vibration and one group with uh, just usual exercise. So it wasn't a structured exercise approach. It was just what those people did usually in their life over a year. So over a period of uh, 18 months, they compared the groups and found that the uh, LIV group had stronger legs. Excuse me one second. Posturally... Vicky, excuse me one second. Vicky, can you make sure everybody's on mute, please? Okay, go ahead, Ian. So they found the um, LIV created a, a, an effect of stronger legs, better balance, less falling and less associated fractures to the falls in the group that used the LIV compared with the group that were just doing regular exercise. And that was over an 18 month period. Now they didn't pick out absolutely enormous changes in bone. They picked out actual changes in bone, but his publication showed that there is a sort of musculoskeletal effect from LIV, particularly in the legs. Um, so, it is not just a bone builder. It is actually something that will help with muscle condition in the leg and balance that's associated to that. So, that and one of the key things that we keep forgetting is that we want to prevent fracture. Period. That's what we're up to. That's what that's what we're, that's our end game. Let's prevent fracture. So, if this is a tool that could possibly assist in with that that's a good outcome. I think that's your key because of the femoral fracture risk. Now, there's a study from an older group of people from Boston. Uh, it was done by Dr. Keel and other researchers in the late 2000s. And they basically looked at people with an average age of 82 years. That was men and women. And they used LIV devices over two years. Now they found no substantive changes in bone and or muscle in men or in the women's femoral, in the women's spinal area. Now, when they looked at the women and these were placebo controlled trials. So you had basically a vibration plate that didn't move. It just made a noise versus one that was moving and making a noise. So it was about as good as you can get to a randomized control trial with a placebo in it. And they found the women though, who use a device over the, that was active over the two years, had 10% increase in their femoral bone in the area BMD in their, in their upper femur, which is really important in terms of effects into the hip region, which is the 
catastrophic fracture, isn't it, that affects people's lives so significantly if you sustain one. Yeah. Um, so, so that was really quite important, but it also had something maybe to do with when you start doing maradine or, or having maradine in your approach to things. Possibly earlier is better than trying to integrate it much later. So it shouldn't preclude people that are in their 70s, but when you start to go to sort of 80 to 90, is it something that's really going to make a big difference in you? It may well be helpful, but if you started at 70, it seems to show possibly more effect than if you're 10 years or so on from that age point. Okay. Um, but the key thing is it does no harm. There were no uh, bad side effects or any harms caused in that older age group. And that's really important because if it is going to be utilized by older people, then it isn't something that's putting you at some form of risk, which when we talk about magnitude of acceleration, larger forces can be problematic. And so we'll go into that as far as the competition that's out there at a much different price point. Um, is Meridine medically approved for osteoporosis? Yes. Yeah, so if you go to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the European countries, Great Britain, Ireland, the Meridine LIV is a class two treatment device for osteoporosis. And it's been through the European uh, and the Australian and the Canadian health systems. Low intensity vibration plates, and that includes Juvent when I was working with it 15, 17 years ago, were approved in Europe uh, and in other geographies. Now the FDA over the years has treated these and still categorizes them as powered exercise devices. As I'm sorry, what was that word? Power? Powered exercise devices. Okay, so what does so that they're mean? Not, they're not actually cleared or approved by the FDA for a, a, a treatment of osteoporosis. They're what we call a class one okay. powered exercise device. So manufacturers and or distributors that work with them register with the FDA that they have the device in the country that's on the database at the FDA for um, registrations and the device is um, available on the market. So that tends to be a trigger for a whole load of other things that are in the questions that we discuss later, like product codes, product reimbursement, what you can actually say about it legally, overtly, mm -hmm. uh, those types of uh, quite important issues. Okay, so let's dive into that as far as reinsurance or um, insurance coverage know at this point. Yeah, so generally, uh, something like a Maradine would be treated as what's called a durable medical equipment. Uh, and that might be something like a treadmill, uh, sorry, like a wheelchair, powered wheelchair, or some form of continuous passive motion machine, something like that, that's external and used as a treatment device. Generally, those have a code which is provided for the device, and then the device can be covered so it's payment covered inside insurance vehicles like Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, et cetera. So at the moment, there's no product code for any whole body vibration equipment that I am aware of in the United States. And then that's the precursor normally to some form of insurance coverage. So you have to have a, code. a number of steps to go through if it's ever going to be something that CMS would actually assign payment to. For, for, if, for if it was a vaccine, then we would get it through with the FDA, but it's not a vaccine. Sorry, I don't mean to be sarcastic, um, <laughs> but it's gonna go through its own slow process. But the possibility of uh, a health savings account or an FSA account could possibly be used towards the purchase of the machine. Is yes, that that's totally correct. So if somebody has one of those uh, savings um, approaches for health expenses. Generally, all you need is a justification. And the justification is really a letter from a medical provider, somebody that's appropriate, that could be an MD, it could be an osteopath, it could be a chiropractor, it could be a physical therapist, it could be somebody that's uh, determined that a device like the Maradine is appropriate for your 
circumstances, and that could be for osteoporosis or what have you. That letter just needs to exist and you keep it in your tax files so that if you're asked by the FSA provider or by the IRS at some future time point about why you spent that money on that device, you've got some evidence that says it was for this purpose. Okay, documentation that states that. Okay, um, so the question about monitoring the progress, we there's nothing to do about that other than the DEXA test at this point. Yeah, so we talked about LIV. It, mm -hmm. It's acceleration of the body standing on the plate. So the individual is upright, their body weight's going down, and then the acceleration from the device, which is um, into the bottom of the feet, travels through the legs and into the axial skeleton, eventually reaches the head. So, but, but there is there is no measurement other than the DEXA because you said MRIs. We don't. Well, well you're making it. A... Yeah, and, uh, and also you know blood markers, uh, urine markers for absorption or or, or turnover. So, really so you're looking at that. You're looking at that piece as far as the people the have. Uh -huh. People have, but it's quite difficult to correlate right. to the whole body because the acceleration doesn't affect the arms, for example. Mm -hmm. So, so it won't have any impacts on your wrist or other parts of the arm. It will affect your legs and your spine, and then depending on where they're where those are being measured. So, the femoral head, trochanter, the lumbar spine in L1. L4, S1, that region, the lower spine, obviously, you know, it's being assessed. So it's measurable and the benchmarks are pretty well understood. So the effect of the LIV, which is clearly going to those regions, can be correlated to some changes in your DXA tests. Right. So I think at the moment, that's what we've got there. And if TBS is coming along as well, more broadly, then that's going to be helpful because the LIV does have an effect on the trabecular structure within the bone architecture. Yes, but as far as the bone markers, that's what Ian was talking about, whether or not, I always recommend people get bone markers um, to see if they're currently losing bones, especially before going on medication, during medication, and work with their doctor around that. So whether or not you're saying that they could have be a benchmark is something that we don't really know about, right, as far as the bone markers. Yeah, correct. Okay. Okay. And then if you're measuring muscle, uh, you can see changes in muscle strength in around six months. So if physical therapists are involved and they're looking at assessment of somebody's um, ability to walk, uh, get out of chairs, do various exercises, um, balance on, on an unbalanced surface, for example, where you're looking at the um, center of pressure measurements and people sway, then you can pick up changes in the musculature much more quickly. But for bone, if you're going to use an LIV device, you've got to wait at least a year between your baseline DEXA and then the second test that you have after you've used the device to see what change may have occurred. So that's very, very interesting because to build muscle is what we need to do as we get older. It's harder and harder to build muscle. I mean, unless you're doing heavy weight lifting, and then that's a whole different thing. But that's, that's a, a very important point. And again, going back to the balance, the balance aspect is key because if you're balanced, you'll less likely fall, which less likely will fracture. Okay. Um, so how about, do you want to talk about the G-force and all that other groovy stuff? Should we do that? I know yeah, so um, a maritime device is a plate and there's a sound actuated upward movement on the plate that you stand on. And there is a control software in the device that measures the load that's going down onto the plate on a continuous basis. So the first thing it does is understand the load that's initially on the plate. So each of us on this webinar has got a different body composition, a different weight, a, a different dynamic mass. You know, we're not all concrete blocks. So we're not dead weights. We're, we're going to be live moving things that are on the plate through a session of it running. So the device, first of all, matches to the load on the plate. It then puts a movement 
into that plate, an upward movement of a distance of about 100 to 200 micrometers, which is tiny, 30 times a second. That's the frequency. Mm -hmm. So that creates, that movement creates an acceleration of 0 0.4 G-force into the bottom of your foot. Now, as it travels up through your legs, it attenuates, which is the sound equivalent of absorption for water or other fluids, it attenuates around 25%. So 0 0.3 G-force gets to your hips and lower spine, and then it attenuates further before it gets to your head. And so it drops down to around 0 0.1 G, which gets to your skull. So that's generally seen as a very safe force level. The 0.1 G is not gonna be a percussive injury risk potential to the brain. And the level of force that's going up through your body, even if it might be fragile, so particularly for people that have got, you know, T scores of minus three, minus four, and, and are very concerned about the fragility in their bone structure, the LIV is not strong enough really to do, to do harm to that. It, it's far lower than a footstep and the force that relates to a footstep going up your leg and then into your trunk. So what we've learned over the years and the clinical trials in the low intensity vibration machines in postmenopausal osteoporosis studies have been in the area of 0.2, to around 0.5 G, 0.4 is a good position because you have enough force at the hips and the uh, femur and into the lower spine to, to, to show measurable changes, but not so large that they're challenging. If you go to lower accelerations, like some of the early studies had, like Dr. Recker in the 1990s, it was 0.2 G, it's probably not enough force. So some of that data is, is not so strong when compared with um, where we probably are now, you know, in our understanding of the force profile and how it affects tissue. So, so what I would say is this is by no means in any way finished. There's a lot more information that will be acquired as we go forward. There are clinical trials that we can talk about in a minute, which are very um, important to further information and knowledge which are due pretty soon. So, so we're on an, an evolving pathway, but essentially a low intensity vibration device is a constant acceleration in the range of 0.2 to 0.5 G. And the frequency seems to be right at around 30 movements a second. Okay, so let's, let's get into some of the, um, the questions that have come in and are like, coming into the chat, which is any problem if you have knee replacement, hip surgery, any metals, any screws, any issues with that? The um, answer is pretty much no. I mean, uh, in animal studies, so it's not humans, the LIV is an extremely good bone formation tool. It, integrates new bone very well around implants. So if you think about where hip replacements have now gone to non-cemented porous in-growth type designs. Low intensity vibration actually creates a very good interface between new bone and titanium implants. Now that's not something that can be promoted or done with in any commercial way in this country and elsewhere because those clinical trials are highly regulated, they're class three, medical device trials are extremely expensive and they're probably never gonna be funded. Now, what has happened in humans is there's been some good data from the group in Hong Kong. Dr. Learn mentioned earlier on, he was, he's one of the sort of uh, well-regarded fracture trauma surgeons in the last 30 or 40 years. His group looked at hip fracture repair and these were men and women that had fractured their trochanter being fixed with plates and or nails and screws. So within five days, post-operatively, they were using an LIV device for the next 26 weeks. 
and they looked at the rehabilitation of those patients with the usual standard of care, rehabilitation <laughs> protocol, and an additional LIV versus just the regular standard of care. So number one, there was no issues, no problems. Muscle conditioning, reconditioning was quicker, better strength in the um, musculature of those that had the LIV. Bone, because you can't go back into somebody's body and take samples of bone out once they've been treated, it, it's, it's difficult in terms of what sort of bone effect you're having, but generally the bone healing was faster, but the general rehabilitation of the people was better, but the LIV had no problems for them. So these were five days post fracture. So if you've had knee replacements, hip replacements, which are similar, the hip replacement is similar to the hip fracture, although you've got componentry in the acetabulum, you know, they're, they're, it's a reasonable benchmark to presume this is not gonna be a problem. And uh, the manufacturer's view and the regulatory bodies outside of this country have approved LIV as not problematic to orthopedic implants. So it, it, it ought to be something that people can feel um, okay with. Now the caveat to all this, which is people with fractures, which are occurring in their spine because of their spinal situation, when can you use an LIV device? So I think the important, the important rules are, discuss it with your medical provider. Is it appropriate to you at that time based on your situation? Um, is your fracture stable? Pain will be the mediator probably. There's no risk from the LIV on the fracture healing process because like we've talked about a couple of times already, the force levels are tiny when compared to walking and standing and, and, and doing usual ambulation. So it's not possible to say you can use an LIV device with a person that has a fracture in a, in a mandated way because everybody's situation is different. But generally it's a safe force level, but it is something that should be discussed between the person and their medical providers before they embark on using a device like an LIV device. So I just want to clarify something because um, you're a guy and if you're a woman with osteoporosis and you're talking to your doctor about LIV, Meridine, they're going to look at you like you're fruitcake. Um, and they say, I don't know anything about this. So are there studies that then people, I like my people to go equipped and say, okay, here's a study. And I want to know because I fractured, would this be helpful? There's that whole dynamic of doctors often intimidating women. So is there something that's more uh, current than the uh, Hong Kong situation? I thought that there was something in 2022 that came out with Penn, University of Penn. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, that wasn't in hip fractures. I mean, it, 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 it didn't show fractures. It was a very good imaging study that showed the anabolic nature of the LIV and how it builds the trabecular bone structure. So it was postmenopause. It was women in the sort of age around postmenopause. Mm -hmm. They used an LIV device. And then the imaging was MRI uh, along with DEXA. Mm -hmm. So it showed for the first time clear trabecular bone size changes, structural enhancement. It also showed fat levels in the vertebrae reduced. So it's really a sort of working model of the hypothesis that we talked about earlier on that low intensity vibration creates a different behavior response in mesenchymal stem cell behavior, suppressing fat biasing osteoblastic formation. Um, there's no study I know of at the moment that's, that's looked at thoracic fractures or, or anything in that area where you use an LIV type device. Mm -hmm. So I think we're sort of into individual patients, people's own experiences with the device and how it may have acted, you know, when, the, when, when they were in that situation. So there isn't, 
a sort of low intensity vibration fracture study. There definitely will be nothing in the higher magnitude acceleration because it's a contraindication in most cases. All right. Higher so, accelerations. So it, it feels like I want you to say, yes, Armand, this is exactly what you need. But it's it's like a calcium supplement. If I take a calcium supplement, will I have osteoporosis? Yes. You know, we're working through, it's the building blocks of how do we get our bones back together? We have to exercise, we have to sleep, we have to have good digestion. All those multi-discipline uh, issues have to be in, in place. And this is a piece, could be a piece of that puzzle. That's a yeah, fair I think for, for, for fractures, there's areas we're going to learn more about, you know, where we integrate with approaches like Sarah Meeks has for alignment of the mid back core, core body alignment. Do you use in some cases offloading bracing for the thoracic lumbar spine, you know, like spina med, that type of thing to get better positioning of your vertebrae in addition to strengthening your muscle in that region? in addition to maybe putting LIV up through it. So you're so, talking about where Sarah talks about the back brace, right? For yeah. those that have fractured, is it helpful to be on the Meridine with the back brace? And that's, that's a separate question. Yeah, this is what we need to learn. And this is where we're gonna look because um, we already know that exercise and back bracing is quite helpful for, mm -hmm. for, for managing fracture risk. I, I know we can't make empirical claims, but there are some things that we can do that seem to make some sense. So part of my ambition is to, is to help to get this information together in, in, the, in the period as we go forward. Mm -hmm. I know Sarah very well. I know the bracing side extremely well. I know the people that integrate these things together. The more we can get Maradine understood or low intensity vibration understood as part of that mix, I think, I think will be helpful. But at the moment, I think we're still early stages. As far as the brace and the yeah, yeah. marriage yeah. of the brace and, and the maritime. Yeah. So I think we're at quite a good stage in understanding what LIV does, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and how it seems to do it. So I think that's very significant when compared to, say, 10 years ago. So there's a much better in information set than we've got, than we had at that time now. And we'll have some more useful information within the next one to two years from for example, the study that Belinda Beck has been doing in Australia called Vibe More. Yes, yes. Because that that's high really impact resistance exercise mm -hmm. training with LIV or LIV on its own or that on its own with a specific target of looking at the hip fracture risk in postmenopausal women with osteopenia and osteoporosis. So for those of you that don't know, Belinda Beck is doing a tremendous amount of work down in Australia. She works with Sherry Betts, who is a physical therapist who focuses on osteoporosis, and they were doing a study together. But Ian is talking about a separate study, which is the, the Vibe More, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Versus the Lift More, which was the program that she had been developing. Um, okay, so if you are on the Meridine, and this came up a couple of times, should you be multitasking? Is it okay to you know bend over on your cell phone or do some computer work, or is it important to be upright and not multitask and 10 minutes twice a day is ideal? Yeah, you don't want to mask. So if you're looking at your side view of your body, you don't want to be multitasking and doing that to your mid back or your neck. You know, you need to be straight, ideally. So mm -hmm. if you were giving a really simple answer, if you're standing on the Maradine for 10 minutes, it should be gentle standing, looking at something nice and thinking nice things. <laughs> so, so it's so it's like aligned to posture, your position, maybe being tense in your trunk, relaxed in your trunk, seeing how your shoulders, your hips, your feet are set up. If you have a full length mirror, using that to to look at yourself. Um, if you're doing a side on, you know how are you helping with your curvature in your back? Um, I think the problem with a phone is you start looking down, we're putting pressure on the C-spine, aren't we? Right. And, yeah. and we're changing some of the, we're hunching ourselves when, when really we should be forcing ourselves up. So there's no problem doing it. I think if you're going to do it, then you probably want to be working with a screen more at line of sight rather than having to look down. So something there is, is good to do. 
Um, but uh, the general view with the Maradine session should just be gentle standing. Which means a... soft knees. Say again? Is, is gentle standing soft knees? Yeah. yeah and not, is... bent. not bent, straight. Uh, okay. It's like the at ease on the parade ground in the military. If you're at attention, you're stiff and rigid. At ease is gentle, but with a straight, right. pretty much straight okay. leg. Elbows can be bent or no? They can do anything you like with your arms because it doesn't really affect the arms. You know, they can hang down by your sides. You can bend them. It, it, it won't really have an effect on that part of the body. It's going up through your legs and then into your spine, into your okay. spinal column. So the protocol, I think, is twice a day for 10 minutes a day. Is that correct? Yeah, we've been... Um, getting more information together from a couple of different pathways. So, so Clint Rubin's people and that research group at Stony Brook have been looking at uh, LIV gap sessions, LIV, um, how does that affect cell behavior? How do the cells respond to it? So they found that input sessions of LIV, a sort of recovery period, and then another one is actually pretty good because the second session the cells are more receptive than they were in the first one hmm. okay so how does that fit into your daily plan of activity concurrent to this a very good meta-analysis was published late last year in uh, osteoporosis international yes. which basically reviewed all the whole body vibration plates mm -hmm. and studies looking at postmenopausal osteoporosis treatment their clinical recommendation around LIV for the lumbar spine was 20 minutes a day, which is a roughly 7,000 minutes a year. So if you go to, well, how does that sort of converge? Well, 20 minutes a day makes sense. When we did Juvent 20 years ago, we thought it was one session of 20 minutes. So that poses all sorts of challenges for people to stand on something for a 20 minute period. So we moved more to the 10 minute sessions after that time point. But if you follow the basic research and some of the animal work that Ruben's people have been doing, then 10 minute session, a number of hours and another 10 minute session of Maradine seems to achieve a better outcome because you get the 20 minutes in the day, but you get the benefit of the recovery period between the two LIV sessions. So that time gap could be five hours or so. Margaret Martin talks about a morning one, an afternoon one, or if you're a morning exerciser, as she says, then have a mid, an early afternoon session and then a later in the day session with the Maradine. So she's talking three or two? So two Maradine sessions, but maybe integrated with other exercise that people might be doing, like cardiovascular work and maybe some other exercise activity that they do in addition to using the LIV plate. You know what's so interesting is um, why is it so hard for us to give ourselves 10 minutes of solitude twice a day? That's the bigger question that I ask because if we really want to try to calm our nervous system and just gain some inner peace, this is so important for stress, re stress reduction and digestion. Why can't we do that? That's a, that's a question that, for the group. So we don't have to answer that because we don't have an answer. Yeah, but from a personal experience, I mean, I've traveled the world a lot. And I think if you go to certain places, it's lifestyle is very different to here. You know, yeah. here's in your face every minute of the day. And it, you've got no time and everything is, you've got to be multitasking five different things. And every second is life and death. Whereas if you go to uh, <laughs> Tibet or something or Oman and go out in the desert, you know, you've got time to think about things. It's, it's a, different, a different environment that maybe allows you that 10 minute session. But, you know, I have heard from a number of people that just relaxing, just looking out the window, looking at some trees, you know, looking at something nice and just letting your mind go and positive thinking at the same time that you're doing that is actually quite pleasant when you're standing on an LIV device rather than watching the news and getting wound up by something that you see on it. you know. This is a really good point because, um, I mean, if you really look at the research that's done at MIT, with the Dalai Lama, um, there is 
evidence about how meditation impacts our life. Let me just put a couple more people on mute. Um, so there's science out there. And for us to think, okay, okay, do I want to take a um, medicine or do I want to take this step for two years and give myself 10 minutes twice a day? I say yes. But that's me. Um, okay. So we talked about this, this one question, DEXA minus four. Should you avoid vibration plate? because you could possibly fracture, you're saying no? No, I think you have to, you must have a conversation with the um, medical provider if okay. you're at a minus four T-score because there might be circumstances that are going to challenge you. Mm -hmm. the, the, the LIV force though, just really simply is far less than when you put a footstep down. So right. if you're walking around and going up and down the stairs and getting in and out of your car and, and, and doing usual activity, then maradine is going to put less stress on you than those other things. So it, it ought not be a problem. Um, but you need to understand it's different. It's small size quite quick. Mm -hmm. So from a, a sort of mechanical force point of view, it's tiny. It, but then it may affect you based on other things that you've got going on in your body. If you're hypersensitive to motion, maybe it's not nice, you know, but most people, if you took a thousand individuals, the vast majority of them find LIV very pleasant, very tolerable and value adding. Um, but there are some people that find it challenges them so they can't use it. But you always, and you know, we're very aware of the regulatory situation and this is a, important health issue for everybody with regard to bone health as we as we age then then it should be a discussion that's properly founded good information medical provider should be involved if it makes sense for you and or your situation before you use a device okay that's uh that's a good let's all slow down oh, all right somebody just saying let's all slow down Beverly, thank you. Um, okay, okay. There's so much to ask, so little time. So no no contraindicators with the um, eye issue, brain issue, detached retina. You have not seen that with the LIV, which is the low intensive frequency. Am I saying that right? Low intensive? Yeah, so there's um the International Standards Organization, mm -hmm. ISO, as a standard 2631, which is human whole, which is human exposure to whole body vibration. So it's, it was, you know, created for tractor drivers, helicopter pilots, people that use pneumatic jackhammers, you know, those types of things, because vibration is a pathogen. So you need to understand the force and the magnitude and what the exposure of that does to the body. So an LIV force, 0.4 G acceleration from a maradigm plate, you can be exposed to that between four and eight hours a day. Right. And that was the ISO 2631. Right. If you go to a, a 10 G force acceleration of a power plate, it's in numbers of seconds of exposure. Now, that's using a, 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 a you know, like an international standard you have to correlate to clinical data that's been assembled. And there are some quite good publications now, like the paper I mentioned earlier on that was in the Osteoporosis International that looked at all the different vibration plates, not just the LIV, but it looked at all of them. And some have got strengths and some have got weaknesses in, in terms of the size of the magnitude of the acceleration or the frequency used or the body area that they were looking at measuring effect in. And then you have to correlate that to vibratory risk and the people that are thinking about using an acceleration plate. So with a low intensity vibration, if you're frailer, older, more fragile, then this is generally okay for you. If you're looking at using it for osteoporosis, numbers of minutes a day, it's designed for that. A power plate, which evolved for vibration training, Maybe if you're a 20-year-old boxer or, a, or an athlete, you know, and you're in good condition, it's, it's an enhancer. 
but you're a different to somebody it might be 82 that's looking for a device that's going to be safe to use because they're concerned about their musculoskeletal health so i think we have to understand the force magnitudes what we're trying to achieve with the devices and the pros and cons of those forces okay um a question that came up, and Vicky's watching this, but I just saw this. What is the minimum time required between the two sessions? Minimum. I've heard sort of three to five hours. Right. Okay. Okay. I mean, you were talking about um, some people are, are very sensitive to um, anxiety or buzzing feeling. So what happens if one were to buy the Meridine and have that experience? What What is the return policy? What is? Yeah, um, our, our sort of written return policy is 30 days, but we're, we're human, you know, and we know, we know the people we deal with quite well because Meridine very rarely is something that somebody just buys online, receives a device and you have no idea who they are. You know, generally it's people that have researched it thoroughly have been um, discussing or following people like Margaret Martin or Sarah Meeks or others um, that we've had a dialogue with. And I talk to people a lot before they buy one. Mm -hmm. uh, they're generally long conversations. They're not short ones. They're 30 minutes, 40 minutes quite often. So, so you know who people are. So, so we'll try and help as much as we can to the circumstances that the person has. So, our, our sort of like written policy is you have 30 days from the day it arrives at your house or your apartment for you to try it out. And if you want to send it back, you get a full refund. But if you get a device and then sometime down the road, it's not helping you, like your circumstances have changed or whatever, um, and that could be six months or longer out, then we will still work with you to, to try and figure out a reasonable um, recovery for you so you're not left with you spent three thousand dollars you can't use this thing what can i what can i do with it so um, is there a that, secondary market for used livs a little bit um mm -hmm. we don't because people buy them for their own home and then they use them forever you don't get very many coming back um so I've got real, real experience with Maradines since 2013, when, mm. when they were first built in the US. So I know how many were built between 2013 and 16, who bought them. And we know what has been achieved since 2017, when we started to bring them into the USA. So the vast, vast, vast majority of them just stay where they went. Um, if they do come back out, then we can refurbish them and supply them to somebody else at... Uh, a different price than a brand new one and well, we know machines we've been working with them for 15 to 18 years or so uh, we know how to service them how to rebuild them how to put them into a decent working order so um i hope that answers that question i, I think it does um and so the price of the machine is three thousand dollars thirty two hundred dollars three thousand dollars tell share the price so our, our regular price is three thousand two hundred. Let me just see. Who else? Oh dear. Everybody's muted, Irma. I know everybody's muted. Okay. Okay. The price is three thousand. $200 regular price for people listening to or watching this webinar, $3,000. And um, we just need a referral through Irma so that we know it comes back to this event that we're participating in. And the delivery time is you're out We're around four weeks, four weeks out. And yeah. to make a purchase, it's 50 percent down, 1500. Yeah. And, and then the balance when the device is being ready to ship to you. So we control the uh, entire supply process from the factory in Germany 
and the deliveries within the states. Now, our lead times may improve actually as we go further forward. Uh, so hopefully we would uh, get towards what we want to be able to do, which is have them in stock and be able to supply within five days. But based on demand and supply factors at the manufacturer, we're closing the gap, but we're still in an average of around four week delivery time. And what's the lifespan of the LIV? How long does it last? Well, I've got real time experience of 11 years now. Um, could go out to 20. I mean, they're built for at least 10 or okay. so between 10 to 20 years. Mechanically, these things are really, really tough. It's going to take a serious, serious impact to damage it from a mechanical point of view. So if you drive your car over it or something, yes, it will get damaged. But <laughs> normal wear and tear from people standing on it and usual activity that you have with it, no. It's electronic though, and it has electrical power going into it. So components could fail in the life in the ele electronic or electrical categories, but they're fixable and we do repair and backup for the machines that are out there. So we can take care of those. And we have done, we've been supporting all the US built units that we know about for people. And we've been supporting all the German built ones that we've been importing since 2017. The product comes with a two year warranty from the day you receive it. But these are highly reliable. So, you know, for, for, for normal use, they should not give you a problem. All right. And tax and shipping, is that, talk about that, please, Ian? Yeah, so shipping arranges shipping ranges between about seventy or so dollars on the on the east coast, up to about a hundred if you're on the west coast. We're located in southeast Florida, uh, near Miami. Um, the other tax tax is charged to Florida residents. And at the moment, we're below the nexus levels that are required as an out-of-state supplier in most states. So there tends to be about $100,000 a, a year or half a million if you're in California or New York or whatever. Threshold that you have to go past. And if you are past that, then you have to deduct sales tax. So at the moment, we're still below the uh, nexus levels. Um, I want to circle back to um, support. Uh, one, one, of, one of the participants said that on one of the sites, the NOF site, which is no longer NOF, has a different name, that there was a problem with the machine shutting off and lack of support in fixing the problem. Are there other companies that are distributors for LIV? One other, but I don't want to make any comment about that. I'm not asking you to make a comment about that, nor should you. Um, all I can do is tell you what I've done mm -hmm. <laughs> ever since I've worked with this and ever since I've had my company with my business partner. We take care of people and we can fix problems. So that's our that's good answer. answer. That's and a good answer. Okay. So before we go, um, and yes, there will be a recording. Yes, there'll be, I'll send out the recording. And there are many, many other questions that came in and Vicky's been calling through them. Um, and if you have to leave, by all means, uh, sign off. Ian, can you stay a little bit longer? Yeah, of course. All right. Um, I wanted to ask the comparison between the other plates that are out there, the, the Amazon buy it now for $100. I, I think that we really need to construct deconstruct that a little bit versus the LIV, the uh, Maradine. Can you talk about that? So let's take Maradine. So Maradine and Juvent are the two low intensity vibration plates which are available in this country. I was a founder of Juvent in 2003 with Clint Rubin and others. So I know that device extremely well. Uh, the company wasn't successful. It went through a chapter 11 in 2009 because it couldn't fund a clinical trial that was needed for FDA purposes. And we basically ran out of money when there was no money to be had anywhere as uh, within the 2007, 2008 collapse of the, uh, of the, the economy. economy. Mm -hmm. So product rights for the Juvent were acquired by a group in Florida and they've been manufacturing a Juvent device 
since about 2012, I think, sometime like that. And then the Maradine company was formed around 2010 and the Maradine device came out around 2013. So there's two low intensity vibration devices here. I think a Juvent's about $6,000, I believe, mm. its price. Uh, it's a 0.3 G-force, but it's like a Maradine. It matches the load constantly through the session of use and always puts into the person 0.3 G. Maradine, as we've discussed earlier, is a 0 0.4. Um, anything else, and these are both patented, and the method that they use to maintain the acceleration in their design is patented, so they're different to the others. So if you go on Amazon and buy a $500 unit, it won't control the acceleration. It's maybe manual controls based on how far it moves and in what directions it moves and then how many movements a second it's running at. But in that vast majority of cases, the acceleration levels coming off those devices are greater than 1G. And they can be anywhere from 1G to 15G. So that's serious movement and it's like analogous to shaking serious quite mm -hmm. serious shaking so you have to stand on those things differently you've got to generally bend your knees suppress the force levels with a maradine you stand straight up with a juvent you stand straight up so you can't really do that on a higher on a higher acceleration level because of it's very uncomfortable and it's and it's going to challenge your brain um and it's not much fun, I think, being hit 30 times a second by Mike Tyson. So uh, whether a big acceleration is analogous to that, I'm just making a supposition. But um, I think if you're looking for low intensity, then you've really got to go shopping with the Maradine or the Juvent. Anything else is different. So, um, um, Vicky, did you have a number of questions that um, should be presented that were different than what we spoke about? Well, I think you've covered really so many of them, but um, there are just maybe a couple here. Um, people wanted to know if there's any place you can see a demonstration of, of how it works, was one question. Um, there's or a place a, yeah. yeah, there's a few um, hospital physiotherapy or private practice physiotherapy or possibly some chiropractic centers that have them uh, as part of their programs. Mm -hmm. And they'll generally um, have them for people to see and get to know. I mean, the, the, the machine is designed for use at home. So it needs to be in somebody's residence because they're gonna be using it every day of the year, maybe, and like we've been discussing, probably twice a day. So it is something that you've um, got to have. Uh, our period, the return period allows you to get it. And if it's not right for you, you can send it back and you get your money back. The thing is, you obviously have to pay us before we'll give you the device. Um, but at least, you know, you've got that ability to um, try it out. But general access to them in places you can go and see them, no, not so much, because they're every day, more than once a day use. Other yeah. whole vibration plates like power plates that you might use twice a week or three times a week it's different because quite often there are um, people going along as part of programs like osteo strong or whatever they may be going and using a device now and again as part of a program or they might be in their gym or spa or other location based on those wbv equipment being pretty popular you know about 14 15 years ago so there was quite a growth at that time in the higher magnitude acceleration training products that are out there. So just remind me, if if I'm a, my weight is, I'll just say 130 pounds, I stand on the machine, somebody heavier stands on the machine, it's recalibrated to their weight. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So my wife's about 140. I'm about 185 to 190. When we both use them, they match the pair of us. Why do you use it? I just go on it sometimes for relaxation. I like it. 
or if I'm stretching, if I've been um, doing some boxing or something, I just go and stand on it and stretch. And uh, it's quite nice. Interesting. Interesting. It's quite good after cycling as well. If you've been doing a long distance bike ride or something and your knees hurt, so you can get on there and ah. like a massage in a way. Okay. Okay. Um, and there's nothing that can build bone in the wrists and arms. You can't stand on the. Um, you can't really do a plank on it for <laughs> ten minutes. Uh, it's not feasible, and, and you need a certain load to tell the device you're on it. So I think um, no, unless some wristband that vibrates comes out. <laughs> Vicky, anything else that you found? Uh, people want to know if you turn the machine off in between uses. Uh, I yeah, it's think. designed to go yeah. to sleep. So okay. um, you, when you switch it on, it goes through an initialization, uh, like a very small countdown for a few seconds, and then you and it tells you that it's ready to go. And you stand on it, and it runs a 10-minute right. session. But it's designed to sleep when those sessions have ended, okay. or um, it can pause. You know, So if you're doing 10 minutes and you're three minutes in, so it's at about the seven-minute period, you get off for some reason, like to switch the kettle off or something. I, I don't know, or do something quickly, go back on it. Then it will run out the rest of that seven minute session. But after five minutes of no loading, it goes to sleep. So you can keep them plugged in, switched on, and they're dormant until you get on and use them. Uh, a number of people that live in areas where you've got like a storm risk, electrical storms and what have you may would, would use like a surge protector between their electrical supply and the wall and the device and have a switch on the uh, surge protector that they may switch on and off. Some people switch them off every time when they finish using. So I don't think there's a hard rule mm -hmm. um, because it is designed to hibernate, you know, to pause and hibernate <laughs> until loaded again um and but if you think so, i just want to sneak another question and were you complete i, I jumped on you i'm sorry ian were no because i think there's an, an important factor for people with a spine spine fracture risk you know having to bend down the switch it on and bend and, and then get back up switch it on and off again all the time you know maybe that's not something you want to do you want to be doing now and again yes so that's a thought that you could also use your big toe to switch the device on and off. You know, it's quite easy to do that mm -hmm. because the, the switch is located very easily next to where the power goes in. So you can use your big toe to switch it on and off so you don't have to bend over. But, you know, I think that there, 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 there isn't a sort of design reason that you have to switch it off. It would probably come down to electrical risk, any surges that could occur, your circumstances, if you've got, frailty issues or worries about fractures or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're moving the device around to different parts of the house or whatever, then you would obviously need to be uh, disconnecting it from the power supply. And and have you ever heard of anybody wearing a weighted vest while using the Meridine? And well, some people do, absolutely. Um, again, I haven't got any sort of hard and fast mm -hmm. um, answers to that because you know there are various opinions about weighted vests there are there are and whether or not you're holding your posture are they appropriate or not for certain people but no you could definitely use that while you're on the device mm -hmm. anything else vicky um <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that you've answered a lot i mean you've covered um all of the health concerns that people have you know whether they have bolts in their feet you know is that going to be a problem if someone has an implant or something in their feet and they're standing directly on it it's something for their doctor to determine yeah i think uh, that is the best path to go and then we can give the person some supporting material that they can discuss with the with the care provider you know regarding the force magnitudes publications the safety profile of the device Instruction for use, manual, you know, that's got all the things they probably want to have at that conversation. But our, our, our view generally is talk, talk to people that know more about it and about your circumstances before you embark on using it. Um, 
and we're not trying to sell you a car, you know, so we're not car salesmen. We're, we're, we're not trying to force you to take this thing. You need to be sure that you want it, you understand what it's going to do for you, and you understand how it fits into your activity plan or your program for managing your bone health. And so you were talking, we were talking about the weight of vessel. Linda was asking, will it enhance the effect of the LIV? You don't know that. There's no data on that. Um, and the thing about the weighted vest is that how you're standing and whether or not you have a particular vertebrae, that's a little bit more compromised. So it's it's an important data point that you're, first of all, that you have, um, that you've examined that properly with a doctor that says, okay, I looked at your DEXA test, a weighted vest is good for you or not. Um, and then if it is, to make sure that you're straight when you're on the machine. So I noticed when I was on the machine at Nancy's house, and Nancy, I'm going to ask you if you want to chime in here for a second. If you don't, that's okay. But I'm going to ask you because that's the way I am. <laughs> so when I was on the plate at Nancy's house, and I leaned a little bit, it, it the everything changed to my jaw. So it was so delightful that it was a little like whisper in my jaw. And it changed if I if I moved, if I if I didn't stand in the proper space. It, it, did I make that up, Ian? No, I think that sounds right. And you know, the ideal foot position is on the device, you've got like a visual, you have a visual display at the center of the front of the device. So your sort of suggested foot position is the big toes uh, either side of that display on, a, on about a line halfway down that visual display, the shoulder width apart. And that's quite important because the sensor that picks up the loading is just like southwest of the visual display in the device. So if you have your feet in the middle towards the front and in that general position, then that's your sort of like sweet spot for mm. the, the force. You move to different parts of the device, go more posteriorly to the back of it, it feels it compresses a bit more. So you can definitely feel a sort of a more forceful output from the device. And again, if you go to the left side or the right side quite a long way, it will move a bit because the top plate is mounted on 10 springs. Six of them are towards the front, four to the back. So it's a bit more sturdy anteriorly. Um, but uh, also your attitude how you're standing, your posture, if you're at the attention position, like you would be in the military, where you really are stiff, you can feel the force up into the top of your head. Back, I feel it in the back of my neck. Um, when you're at the at ease or in a relaxed stance, it maybe tickles you under the cheekbones, you can feel your teeth chattering a wee bit. We put that together. Nothing unpleasant, it's just telling you we you're being accelerated. Mm -hmm. If you bend your knees about 30, 40 degrees, put your fingers up, put your hands on your uh, patellas, you can definitely feel it going into your tibia and up into the patellas. But then it's not going anywhere further up, so that's not too clever to do for too long. You want to do that. So I'm going to bring Nancy on. Nancy, are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So Nancy, if you can take yourself off mute, can you do that? There you go. Mm -hmm. So Nancy, Nancy has been using the, the Meridine. Nancy has been uh, has a tremendous amount of experience in the exercise world. Um, do you want to share a little bit about your experience using the machine and what made you just sure. sure. Um I I was very interested in the Meridine after the presentations that I listened to last year at the National Osteoporosis Summit. I was really fascinated uh, by the prospect of using this. So I did order one. Um, I received it last March. Um, I use it most days. Um, I didn't realize the twice a day, 10 minutes. So now I'm gonna up that. I've just been doing it once a day. Um, I'd had a DEXA and a TBS after about seven months of using uh, the Meridine. The thing that was quite interesting to me was that my TBS increased from the year before 1.37 to 1.42. And um, my DEXA scores were about the same, maybe just a little bit better for the spine, small percentage 
um, decrease um, in my hips. But I, I told Nirma, uh, Irma about the change in the TBS and we were trying to determine was that increase as a result of using the Meridyne at about the same time I started using the Meridyne, I started a strength training program. So I was doing that in conjunction with the Meridyne. And so seven, seven months later, I see an improvement. So together, Nancy, is it? I'm sorry? Is it probably the two together? Together, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're both different, but they're com, but they're supporting each other in a way, aren't they? In that you've got strength and power changes that are maybe low frequency, but if you're putting in this quite fast stimulation of the cell formation <laughs> process, you can't achieve it with just the strength training. Right. I really appreciated your explanation at the start of, of this uh, Zoom call because um, it sort of enhanced my understanding of how the process works. So thank you for that. Because uh, there's a nice publication. I'll, I'll share stuff um, after this uh, summary paper that Ruben and other people wrote in 2019, which is just an explanation of what's happening at the cellular level. And it's really good because it shows the behavior in the cell is different when it's getting this compared mm -hmm. to these types of inputs. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really quite powerful because then that correlated to, like we talked about earlier on, the University of Pennsylvania study that showed the trabecular enhancement in the MRI scans. And that would be similar to maybe what you're reporting with trabecular mm -hmm. bone scores, you know, mm -hmm. that there is a change in bone quality that's taking mm -hmm. place. And we may not necessarily be measuring massive changes in the quantity, but the quality of the bone is being enhanced. And, you know, this is quite a good evidence that longer term use is something that we need to do. Because the trouble with 12 months with DEXA is too short a period, isn't it? Because bone takes longer to really change significantly worse or better. So a 12 month period doesn't really give you enough time. But if you're getting more information now about what might be occurring in that period, mm -hmm. TBS and the ZT scores, then I think this is all very helpful. And whatever marker changes can then be correlated to those densitometry or radiographic based calculation based change data. So thank you, Nancy. Did you have something else, Nancy? No, just um, it's definitely a motivation um, mm -hmm. to continue the, the use of it and also to increase the daily usage to now twice a week, uh, uh, twice a day, pardon me. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for hopping on, for being um, willing to do oh. that. You're so good like that. Uh, Linda is here and this is, this is so good. So Linda <laughs> has a Meridine and she's going to show us. Yes. Are we going to do, Lynn? Yes. Wait, just a second. Okay, got a spam call. Okay, okay. Um, I'm in my bathroom, and so I just actually, mm. and I saw that you should be doing it twice a day. I thought, well, it's three hours before I go to sleep, so I just stood on it while you were talking. But um, <laughs> so here, here it is. Okay. All right, and it's just. Um, let's see if I can do this. If I stand on it, let's see, let me stand on it and then I can direct it down. Hear that? Um, go. Can you see it? Are you lying on it? What are you doing? No. You're, You're upside, upside down, down, Linda. You're upside oh, down. Well, I'm trying to show. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to show the Meridine is it's counting down while I'm standing on it. Okay. And if, if the position can you kind of hear it? Yeah, but we only see your thigh. Oh, yeah. Oh, you only see my thigh. There you go. There you, there go. you go. That's okay. it. Okay. So I'm standing on it, and you can mm -hmm. see where the little feet are. 
and it just counts down. That's it. 10 so, minutes. If I went, you know, like to, if I'm using my, brushing my teeth and I go off of it for a minute mm -hmm. and then spit out, and I get back on and it counts down. Great. Fabulous. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you very much for offering to do right. that. It's, it's my pleasure. It was, um, did a lot of research and I'm going to have a DEXA scan next month. So I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, if, if there has been any change. So the key thing about that is if you see no loss, that's an improvement. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sometimes we all think, no, there was no increase and decrease. No, but if there's no loss, this is a win. Mm -hmm. a win. So thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, somebody was asking about insurance covers DEXA every two years. Yes, that's the way it is. It was set up by Medicare. Um, sometimes you can have a, your doctor write a script um, and get it covered every year. And then out-of-pocket expenses varies all over the place. I had a quote for like $2,500 from University of Pennsylvania and then a much different price. But you want to go to a quality um, place that has a trabecular bone score. But yes, Medicare set the rules on that every two years as far as the insurance is concerned. So I'm going to um, remove Linda and Nancy. Um, and that's, I think we're going to wrap up. Is there, Vicki, was there anything else that that we wanted? Oh, Karen was asking about her eight pound cat isn't enough of a load to wake up the device, right? <laughs> I need at least 66 pounds. Yeah. Oh, um, so is there a website? A tiger or something, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. is, there a website? Is, is the website up? Is it operational? What What's going on with the website? Yeah, Maradine.us uh, is running. I mean, we're just upgrading to a new, more video based. So we'll have some new video and uh, other materials. Also, our shopping cart process, our e commerce process will be through Shopify rather than PayPal, which we've been using so far. So it'll be a much more straightforward purchase process. Really? Um, Irma, yes. I suggested a question in advance and posted it in the chat. Maybe you could explain this? my name is Paula Katz. Paula Katz. Oh, no, and no. maybe you could ask why it is so expensive. It's just not affordable for most people in this country who would love to use it. And the large majority of people just can't afford it. And one would think if you made it more affordable, you could increase your volume sales. And help that many more people yeah it's good it's a good question paula we're we're tied to where it's made the materials that they use in it the labor that they use to produce it uh then the physicals that we have to deal with like we've got to ship it across the atlantic you can't put it on a boat it has to come air freight and then we've got to get it into the us uh and then use us freight carriers like fedex etc um, and then we've got to take care of the US-based business. So these are expensive for us to buy, uh, to start with, um, based on the current design. Now, whether in fact there's a redesign in the future, which could be less expensive, could we manufacture in the United States? Would that change things? You know, there are circumstances that could be beneficial as we go forward, but at the moment we're pretty much in this... Um, situation that we are in, which is produce it in Germany, get various parts from different locations, have to change all your manufacturing sourcing because of COVID and uh, Ukraine war and all sorts of bits and pieces in the uh, electric electrical part supply chain, re-shift from China to Europe to get cases, housings, and other bits and pieces. It's a class two medical device. So everything you do has to be documented, validated. You have to go through a large amount of regulatory work, audits and all sorts of things to be allowed to make changes. And, it, and that just ramps up cost. Um, so yeah, I think it is a challenge for most people at $3,000. Um, and if we could change it in the future, we're definitely motivated to look towards that, but we can't do it with the current device that we have. You know, it costs us a lot. 
and we've got logistic issues that we have to deal with like you've got 3,000 miles of water or something between where they build them and here and then we've got a big country that we live in you know which is as big as Europe so thank you I um, can't give you a fantastic answer but you know we're we're not profiteering pirates or anything you know we're we're, we're realistic and we understand the challenges that people have at this time in life with a subject like bone and fracture risk management and trying to keep a good quality of life. So uh, can it be purchased in Canada? Uh, yeah, you pay more up there, but um, it's a Health Canada approved device in Canada, but they're more expensive than they are in the USA. Um, and we invalidate distributor contracts if we supply something to Canada or a Canadian or the Canadian company supplies it down here or we try and supply the UK or the UK tries to supply it to here because it's electrical medical like we were talking about and it needs warranty and support so if a unit fails who's going to take care of it um, who's going to support the manufacturer's warranty for example so so there are true factors and then if you go to the other geographies like Europe, like Europe Canada Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, those distributors have to be registered entities with their local uh, agencies for medical devices like Health Canada, for example. So you then have import issues, export issues of a medical device in other places. United States is a lot freer because it's just a powered exercise device. So things can move around more easily, whereas in other places it's, it's a bit more restricted because it's a medical device so you had talked about at some point you're putting a, a video on your website because trudy was asking who tells you how to use it well there's a pretty well the manufacturer has to because it's part of the instructions for use so so there's a pretty comprehensive um book that comes with the device on how to use it on my website maradine.us for a number of years i've had video from people like Sarah Meeks explaining how to use it. Uh, we've had how to unbox it and set it up and run it and other materials that you can look at, uh, which hopefully is useful. Okay. So as we come to a close, if you're interested in learning more, Ian, how do people reach you? Uh, Ian, I-A-N, at copahealth.us. And if you would be dot us, and if you would be kind enough to CC me on that communication, that would be great. Very, very helpful. So, um, no payment plan, right? Just one last question. I was going to get in there. Yeah, I mean we're a care credit provider. Okay. Approved. So if you have care credit, um, you can purchase the device in a number of um, plan uh, plan approaches they have. There's a two year repayment one, which has an interest rate applied. However, there's a six month repayment, which has no interest. We, we just eat a higher fee from the uh, care credit, but that gives you the ability to split the cost over six payments. There are also some PayPal related payment plans, you know, buy now, pay later. I think they're four and or six month periods. Okay. Ian, one more time with the email address. Somebody was asking, I think I did it too quick. It's Ian at copahealth.us. Yeah, at C-O-P-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot U-S. Okay, so I put it in the, oh, thank you, Vicky. Yeah. So, this is good, Vicky's quick. Okay, Ian, thank you. Thank you for giving us so much time and, and information. And um, it feels like it's a cutting edge tool. <clears throat> As another piece to add, to our, um, our osteoporosis pocketbook, right? Or to our, our I'm looking for the, the right container um, as another tool. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. You're so, welcome and happy bones to you all. Happy bones. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Um, before we go, if you wanna just thank Ian and anything that you wanna say in the chat, that would be so nice. It's lovely to, when somebody gives so much time just to get some feedback. So. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Very helpful information. Thank you both. You're so welcome. Much. Thank you.
All right. So Ian's gone. He hung up. Ian's gone. <laughs> he went bye-bye. I should stop the recording. <laughs>